Firstly, thank you for turning up. I know that I'm the one thing standing between you guys and lunch. So uh, <laughs> and there's not much incentives in terms of, you know, after I like, was a day three of the conference now, and you know, it's like, I was getting kind of tired of sitting in rooms and listening to people talk about all sorts of stuff, and you just want to kind of have a bit of a break. But uh, anyway, thank you for turning up. I am going to talk about a couple of interesting JSRs, but first a little bit about me. Who am I? My name is Manik Sertani. Um, I work for Red Hat. I'm a part of JBoss's, uh, uh, JBoss's a, a part of Red Hat. We were acquired by Red Hat several years ago. I'm, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with JBoss, right? Who's not heard of JBoss? Who does not know what that is? Right. Good. I'm not going to explain that. I don't know who that guy is. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Somebody put his hand up. So, okay. Among other things, I'm the founder and project lead of Infinispan, which is an open source data grid product. Uh, who's heard of Infinispan? Who knows about it? Okay, a few hands. I mean, this talk isn't actually about Infinispan, but I will mention it very briefly at the end, and I'll talk a little bit about it, because it's relevant to the two JSRs I'm going to talk about. Um, I am the spec lead of JSR 347, uh, which is a data grid uh, JSR, and I'm Red Hat's um, expert group member for JSR 107, and I'll talk about that as well. So without further ado, let's launch right into part one. I'm going to start about JSR 107. Now, who knows about this JSR? Who's heard of this JSR? Okay, not many, I will talk about it. It has got a very dubious accolade of being the oldest running JSR and still, that, that's, still, um, in, that's still open really. Hence the number 107, it's really, really old. It's been around for about 12 years now and it's still not, uh, not finished. So it's kind of dubious, kind of like, you know, why do we need this thing, right? It's actually a really, really important JSR. It's important for a number of reasons, right? Application caching is a well-known pattern for performance, for performance improvements in many applications, especially distributed applications, especially in highly scalable applications. Everyone knows about this pattern. People have been doing this for a long time, right? But there are no standards around it, and that's really, really bad, and I'll talk about why that's bad in a second. Now, JSR 107 does not just cover um, standalone caches. It also covers distributed caches. I'm going to talk about that in detail. <laughs> Um, and as a standard, it has been missing from the Java platform for a very long time. Now, people have found ways around that, but again, I'm, I'm going to explain why that's not necessarily a good thing. So let's have a think about why caches are actually important. Now, it's a fairly well-known pattern. Like I said, it's a fairly proven pattern to, to boost performance. When data is hard to calculate or expensive to retrieve, if you're doing some complex calculations, you don't want to repeat that complex calculation several times. Or, for example, if you're hitting a database which is very expensive to hit, you don't want to be doing that all the time. That very quickly becomes a bottleneck. Whether it's a database or a web service or some remote service, right? That very quickly becomes a bottleneck. And caching this data is a very important um, performance boost. Now, like I said, people know about this. People have been doing, about this, doing stuff about this for a long time. Um, people build handmade caches, homemade things, and have been doing this, again, for a very long time in their applications, in their projects, right? So I'm, I'm sure everyone's done this. Who, who, who's, give me a show of hands. Who's done this before? Who's, who's built their own homemade caches, right? All right, question. You, how did you do it? Well, what's the first thing you did? First thing would be a hash map. A hash map, exactly, right? Very, very common solution. You take a map and you start putting things in that map, right? You will, instead of going to the database all the time, you'll first check the map, see if the object is there. If it's not there, you'll go to the database, right? Now, what are some of the problems around that? I mean, it's not just a hash map. Next person. Okay, yeah, that, 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 that's a more complex, uh, advanced... Uh, exactly, exploration and validation, right? Very important things. If you don't do that, you're going to run out of memory, and that's a really bad thing. Right? So you now need to have extra logic and extra threads and stuff to clean up this hash map. Right? So that becomes complex. Another thing is transactions. If your code is actually transactional and you're, if you're putting stuff in this cache and you have to roll back that transaction, you want to go and reverse all this stuff as well. Again, doing that by hand is expensive, it's complex. And before you know it, you've now built this really complex beast that you now need to maintain. And chances are it's suboptimal as well. So people tend to use libraries for this. There are lots of libraries around that do this really, really well. And I would say you should never, ever build your own cache. It is, it is just a waste of time. It's completely unnecessary. Even for simple cases, use an existing library. Right? Infinispan is one of them, EH Cache. There's several others, lots of good open source ones. Use one of them. Right? But one of the problems with using these um, pre-built, reusable libraries is that there, there's no standard around them. Their APIs are different. They look different. Their shapes are different. They're all kind of map-like, but, you know, 
that they're different, which means it's hard to migrate from one to the other. It means there's a learning curve each time you try and use one of these things, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of why JSR 107 is important, to try and standardize the APIs around temporary caching, application caching, right? So um, I'm going to realize this is a fairly short presentation, so I'm going to kind of skim through the main features of JSR 107 with a few examples and show you what we're doing over there. So the primary cache API is kind of map-like. Now, the reason why we used map as a starting point is because, like, like you said, the gentleman over here just said, most home road caches are based around hash maps, right? So it makes it very easy for people to move off of home road um, handmade caches onto a standardized cache, right? Now, the reason why it's map-like and not actually a map is um, a number of reasons. So, so the JSR covers not just simple in-memory caches, it covers distributed caches, it covers caches that are persisted on disk and things like that. And certain map, -like map operations are very expensive to do in a distributed fashion or if you're touching disk. A very simple example is doing a put, right? So map.put, what does it do? What does it return you? The existing value, the old value, right? <coughs> Who actually uses that old value? How often do you use that old value? Very rarely. Most of the time, you're throwing it away. Now, that's okay if you're in memory, if you're on a single node, it's cheap. It doesn't cost you anything to get the old value. You just throw it away, big deal. But if you're running in a distributed environment, that's very expensive to do. You've got to make another remote call to fetch the old value first, serialize it, put it on the wire, deserialize it, blah, blah, blah. Very, very expensive stuff. And then you throw it away. So what's the point, right? So this is why it's not in the actual API. This is why the cache API is map-like, but not exactly a map. Now, that's only one example. There are a few others as well. I'll talk about that. Um, I mean, even remove, you, know, you should just remove the value, not return the old value and things like that. Right. Other operations like values, key set, entry set, all those big collections that you get back, again, very expensive if you're in a distributed environment. Very expensive if half the cache is persisted on disk. You're going to run out of memory if you try and do a distributed entry set across a thousand nodes. <laughs> you can't do that. So again, these aren't in the, the cache API. Um, there's a very simple example of how you would use the cache API. Um, using JSR 107. The, the cache manager is a JSR 107 construct. It acts both as a factory to create caches, but also as a repository to hold existing caches, right? So you, you do a cache manager dot get cache, like in that line over there, um, and caches are named. You can attach names to them, so you can segregate your data. You can namespace your data accordingly, um, and it will create it if, need, if it needs to create it. Otherwise, it will just return you an existing cache if it's already been created and it is up and running. So it's a very, very simple example here showing you kind of map-like functions on the cache. I'm storing data, I'm retrieving data, I'm checking whether data exists. Um, now, if you look down there, the last couple of lines over there, you'll see that it is not just map-like, but it's specifically concurrent map-like. So you have all these atomic operations on cache as well. You can do a put if absent, you can do a replace, things like that, right? So this is really designed for heavily multi-threaded, heavily concurrent environments. It's not necessarily more or less efficient. It's just functionally different. Um, it's, a, it's the same performance, really. It's just functionally different. What's the value? Well, the value is, is that you, do, if you, do, you don't want to replace something. You don't want to do a put if the, um, if the entry already exists. It's the same operation as concurrent map dot put if absent. So it's just functionally different. So in addition to the basic API, we've also got listeners. Sometimes you want to actually know what's going on. You want to know. Um, when, when threads or when parts of your application change your cache and either store stuff or remove things and you want to be able to react to that. So this is where listeners come in. Um, the JSR, we define a bunch of uh, listeners over there, these interfaces which you can implement and then register as callbacks and you'll get notified when things happen. Um, yeah, there's not a lot to say really except that... No, listeners are local to a specific node. So if you are interested in events happening across an entire cluster, you want to, you want to deploy the listener on every node. And then you'll you know, be notified of anything happening anywhere in the cluster. That's how it works. The reason why we chose not to have the actual events distributed is that's very, very expensive to implement. I mean, it, it can be done. It's not that it can't be done. But then you have this whole network mesh of messages going all over the place. And that becomes very, very expensive all of a sudden. And it's open to abuse. I mean, a lot of people just go and register global, message, global listeners without thinking too hard about it. And it works fine on one server and two servers. And before they know it, they're up to 10, 20, 30 servers, and everything slows down and you know, stops working. So that's not so good. So yeah. 
One important point to note about listeners is that by default they are synchronous. And what I mean by synchronous is the same application thread that causes the event, say it's a put, or you're creating something or you're removing something, that same application thread is going to call your listener. So when you're writing a listener, when you're implementing a listener, it's very important to keep that in mind. Your listener should not sit and do something, you know, really complex and slow, a thread dot sleep through and right behind. A few hands, okay. So uh, for, for the benefit of the rest, what write through basically means is that you, uh, when you store something in the cache, in addition to storing it in memory, you also store it through a cache, uh, through a cache writer to disk or to some persistent storage. Right? And the reason why you would do that is to actually provide durable caches. So if you want to restart your application, you can re reload everything from disk straight into memory, and you've got a warm start, basically. That's one reason why. The other reason why you write through is if you don't have enough memory for all the data you want to store, and you can passivate some data onto disk that's not frequently used, and the rest in memory. Frequently, that's actually cheaper than actually going to a database and things like that, even if it has to go to disk and be read off of disk again. So to do that, uh, so that's write through. Write through means that uh, you, you write to memory and to disk. Write behind is very similar to write through, except that the application thread only writes to memory and then returns, and asynchronously that's flushed to disk periodically. So that's cheaper for the application, but it means that not everything happens synchronously, and there could be data loss. So yeah, that, that's the trade-off that um, you have when you configure write through or write behind. So the JSR supports both write through and write behind, and to do that, we've got these SPIs, the, the cache loader, and the next one, which is the cache writer interface. Um, they, they simply do what, what the name suggests. A cache writer persists things from memory onto disk, and a cache loader is the reverse. It loads it from disk back into memory again. So if you try and look for something in the cache, if it's not in memory, you check the cache loader, see if it's there, and then you return it if it's there. Um, I'm sorry, what do you mean by redundancy? I'll get to the distributed point later on. That becomes a lot more interesting in a bit. So, yeah. um, so essentially what this is all about is, what, this, what these SPIs are all about is you can implement different uh, loaders and writers for different types of persistence engines. Um, for example, InfiniSpan, which does implement or will implement 107, we've got um, cache loader and cache writer interfaces, uh, uh, implementations, for, for Amazon S3, I can persist stuff onto that. I can use Barclay DB. I can use um, a database via JDBC. I can use all sorts of things to actually persist or retrieve data. Right. The next thing I want to talk about is a programming model around it. Now, this is fairly new to the JSR. It's one of the new things we've started putting in since we've um, revitalized the, the standard. Who's heard of CDI? Who knows what CDI is? A few hands. Who knows what Spring is? All right, good. So now that's going to be really easy to explain CDI. CDI is a standardized version of Spring, since everyone knows what Spring is. Uh, as everyone knows, Spring is non-standard. Spring is a proprietary um, um, whatever framework, whereas CDI has the same goals as Spring, achieves the same thing, but it is a part of Java EE. It's part of Java EE 6. It's going to be a part of Java EE 7. It's going to be a very, very important part of Java EE moving forward. Um, so, so since JSI 107 is a part of the Java EE ecosystem, we tie into CDI. We allow you to use your CDI beans, your CDI programming model to, um, to, to access the JSR 107 cache. Now, I'm going to go through this little example here. Let's look at that class. Let's call it message service. I mean, that, let's assume that's a CDI bean. It's doing some work over there. Um, if you're familiar with Spring, it would be a, a Spring bean is not very different. Um, and let's look at that first message, the first method over there, get greeting. Now, use your imaginations here. That, that method's not really doing very much. It's just concatenating two strings, right? It's kind of a boring method. But let's use our imaginations here. Let's assume that's doing something really complex and really expensive and really, really slow, right? You want to do that the first time because you don't have that data. But for subsequent hits for the same user, you don't want to do that complex calculation. You want to cache the result. Now, normally, if you're using a JSR 107 cache or a homemade cache, what you would do is you would check the cache. If it's not there, you do the calculation. If you do the calculation, you store it back in the cache, and then blah, 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 right? A very, very common pattern, boilerplate. Everyone knows how to do it. It's really boring. What CDI does is it takes away the tedium of doing all that stuff, where I can just annotate that method as cache the result of that method for me, will you? And that's it. And CDI will do it. CDI will create a JSR 107 cache, cache the result of that method, 
any time after that 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 method is invoked, it's not actually going to execute the contents of that method. It's going to get the value from the cache. So it suddenly makes using a JSR 107 cache really, really easy. Now, other platforms have had this for a long time. I mean, Python's Django has had this for a long time. Ruby on Rails has had this for a long time. Java has not. And for the first time, we're actually trying to bring it up to speed, you know, modernize the, the platform a little bit. So that would be a call to get reading on this instance of the pitch service would always be the same option. Well, it depends on the type of bean it is. So, I mean, CDI, you've got different application scopes and things. If it's a global scope bean, for example, um, it's going to be application wide and things like that. Yes, you can. So I was going to show you the other two examples now. The first one's a very simple example. We're just caching the result of that particular method. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. The, the other two examples over there, the second one, for example, lets me specify which cache I want to use for, for the results of that. The, the last example over there says if that method's ever invoked, actually remove an entry from the cache, basically invalidate an entry, and things like that. So I can, with these annotations, I can have these triggers all over my application and control what is cached when and where and how. Um, so, so which parts of the result are relevant, which should be cached, which should not, things like that. Right? The first example is a very, very basic one, just to kind of get you started, and then complexity increases as you go down. Does it cache an object level? Yes, it does. I'm sorry? Oh, no, not per object. Um, so basically, if you look at the second example, it will, um, I can specify that one cache for everything, really, for every, every time that method is invoked. So for a particular user, like the argument, if argument is anything, then only the cache. Absolutely. I mean, the argument becomes the key, basically. So in, that, in, in the first two examples, the user is the key, and the result of that method is the value. So you can think of this as, like, you know, say, creating a hash map with good bias. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm sorry, compound keys, absolutely as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I, um, the, the second example that uses compound keys, there are two values over there, two parameters to that. This operation thread safe? Yes, yes. I mean, well, this, this is just the standard, so I mean, the implementations will be thread safe. I mean, whichever um, EH cache or InfiniSpan or whatever that implements these, this stuff will be thread safe. Um, there are examples if you download InfiniSpan and have a look at this. I mean, all of this is implemented in InfiniSpan already. So download the distribution, have a look. There's, there are There's lots of sample code and stuff. So um, yeah, you should go and give that a try. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Again, you can, um, depending on how you configure that cache, you can do that. You can configure it to. Um, there's an option in JSR 107 to store the contents as binary as opposed to as objects, in which case it actually does serialize the object very early on and then stores the byte array, in which case you are guarded against uh, yeah, changes to the object. Does it work in the cluster? I'll get to that. that, that that's, um, that's a whole different section about clustering, so I'll get to just a second. So the other thing I want to touch on very briefly is transactions. So who uses JTA? Is JTA interesting to people out here? Yeah, it is, right? Yeah, a lot of people try and say JTA is like old-fashioned and boring, but no, this is really useful. A lot of people actually use it. <laughs> so um, we try to bake that into the standard as well, that anything that does, that implements JSR 107 does need to be JSR, uh, J JTA compliant, does need, does need to play nice in a JTA environment, does need to be able to roll back if you're participating in a transaction and things like that. Now, one of the things about the spec that actually annoys me a lot personally, is that, um, well, designed by committee, the, the, overall, the overall decision was to make JTA optional. It's like, you know, firstly, it's not a standard if part of it's optional. It's like, <laughs> that's not a standard anymore, is it? <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so some implementations may be JTA compliant, some may not. Some may just, you know, throw an exception if you run in a JTA container and some will work. Um, InfiniSpan is JTA compliant. I think that's important. It's important to me. It's important to users of my project and things like that. Um, there have been several. There have been actually several, which is interesting. I'm not going to name names. <laughs> it's it's a small world, so yeah. What was the main motivation for not? I mean, you don't want to cache something which is transactional. Um, sorry, the main motivation for not being JTA compliant? Well, it's just because some. Yes, I mean, the main motivation is that a lot of people think JTA is expensive, 
that it's expensive to participate in a two-phase transaction and register with the transaction manager and all of that because you've got to maintain a lot of extra resources in memory. Yes, yes. Um, but also a lot of people think JTA is slow. And um, as a result, a lot of people will say, well, no one uses JTA, it's too slow. But as I've seen from hands up here, people do use JTA, it is important, right? So, yeah. Uh, okay, so moving on from, from JSR 107, I'm going to shift gears a bit and talk about JSR 347. Now, the reason why I've kind of deflected and not really answered any questions to do with distribution, clustering, and things like that is because I want to address a lot of that in this section, right? JSR 107 is supposed to be um, clusterable in the sense that, in the sense that the, the APIs kind of have been designed with that in mind that a lot of the implementations will be clustered or may be clustered. But it's not mandated, it's not enforced, it's not a part of the spec. It's just that the APIs should not hinder any clustering, should not purposely, you know, like, that, like the put method, should not return the old value because that will make any cluster implementation really slow. But it does not mandate anything like that. And this is where JSR 347 comes in. Now, JSR 347, oops, I'm already set slides there. So, JSR 347 builds on top of JSR 107. Right? JSR 347 is all about data grids. Data grids, um, by definition, if you look at a clustered cache as, if you look at a cache as a temporary object store, and if you look at a clustered cache as a temporary object store that works across a cluster that is distributed, that works nicely with a distributed application, you could think of a data grid as a distributed in-memory structure that is not necessarily temporary. So you, you don't think of it as a cache anymore. A cache is meant to be a temporary thing. Um, you could use a data grid as a distributed cache, but you could also use it as a permanent store for certain types of data, depending on how durable you want your data to be, uh, what sort of latency requirements you have, and things like that. You could use a distributed grid as um, a permanent store. Um, data grids would achieve persistence using two mechanisms. One is persistence to disk, and the other is uh, um, durability via replication. So you maintain enough copies in a network, so on and so forth. Right? So if nodes were to fail, you're not going to lose anything. Um, so JSR 107, the API for 107, um, is, is really useful for, for data grids as well. Uh, as well. This is very similar. It's storing data, retrieving data. It's, it's like an object key value store, key value NoSQL store. Um, um, JSR 347 builds on top of that because you want to do more than just cache stuff. It's more than just storing and retrieving data. Some of the main things you want to think about in a data grid are uh, querying. If your, data, if your data set is really large and it is distributed, if you want to think of it as a permanent data store, you want to be able to query it. You may not always have all the keys at hand. With a cache, you will. I mean, because I mean, a caches are temporary. They're relatively small usually, so you have the entire key set in, at hand. Um, with a data grid, you may not. Chances are you don't have the key set at hand. You want to be able to query it. You want to be able to do something like a SQL query or something similar to be able to, uh, to, to address the larger data set. In addition to that, um, since JSR 347 is distributed by nature, it is clustered by nature, the most expensive thing in any distributed application is what? What's the most expensive thing in any distributed application? The network, exactly. Communication between nodes. By far the most expensive thing, right? So as a result, you want to optimize, to, you want to optimize any sort of API to minimize network communications, right? So one of the things that, uh, that's very common in a distributed environment is, is distributed code execution, or MapReduce, where you actually push code to data as opposed to data to code, right? So instead of pulling back your entire data set to one node to process something and give you one answer, it's sometimes cheaper just to push the actual code out to find the data in that grid and run locally on that node and so on and so forth. Right. So again, APIs there are important. Um, in addition to that, non-blocking APIs are important. Right. Again, because keep keeping the network in mind, just doing a get sometimes may be too expensive. You want to do a get asynchronously or you want to do a put asynchronously and not block and wait for the response, but, you know, get a future and check for the response later and things like that. So again, very, very useful things in a distributed environment. Um, Co-location, very important as well. So very often you have a transaction that touches multiple entries and does, changes lots of bits of data. Now, running that in a distributed environment is expensive because you need to you know, communicate with all the various nodes involved which actually own, that, own those keys and actually store that data. Right? So to optimize for that, you try and co-locate that data. You try and tell the grid, hang on a second, these five entries are always going to be used together. Make sure you store them together on one node so that I don't have to you know, ping across the network and uh, minimize the network overhead and all of that. 
And again, an API to control that, that's important. Um, and finally, an eventually consistent API, I'll talk about that later on. So a little bit about 347 again. Um, um, so JSON 107, the, the, the goal of 107 is to include it in Java EE7. Right? It's important for Java EE7 because one of the things about Java EE7 is to make enterprise Java more cloud friendly, to make it the preferred application for, for building platforms as a service and things like that, right? <laughs> And to do that, uh, JSR 107 is very important. Um, JSR 347 is really important as well for cloud. And as Java EE progresses and gets more and more cloud friendly, um, the goal is to try and get JSR 347 into Java EE 8. And that sounds like a, you know, something that's really far away, but it's actually not that far away. I mean, EE 7 is progressing really quickly. Um, already the, the, the constituent JSRs for EE 7 is fixed. That's not going to change anymore. So, so that, that's frozen. Um, and EE8 is going to be starting, ramping up soon enough, and this is going to be included in that. Now, before I go into, I'm not, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of 347, but before I do that, it's a quick caveat. 347 is still a new spec. It's very early days. So all the stuff I'm going to show you, a lot of them prone to change. Don't, don't think, I mean, the, the first half that I showed you, all the stuff, all the APIs in JSR 107, that, that's pretty much complete now. That's pretty much what the JSR is going to look like. The stuff in 347, uh, that, that, that's certainly prone to change. I mean, I'm just going to, I'm going to show you some stuff more in terms of concept to show you what, what, what sort of ideas are going to be in. But the specific APIs are definitely prone to change. Yeah. In fact, um, sorry. Not specifically, no. But, but there are strategies around that. I'll talk about that in a second. Sharding. Is sharding um, or support for sharding a part of JSR 347? Now, um, one of the things I'm doing with 347 is I'm running the entire JSR completely in, open, in the open. I mean, I'm an open source guy. That's my background. With most other JSRs, or, or you know, up until relatively recently, to get involved in a JSR is, is a problematic, not problematic, but it's kind of a tedious thing. So who in this room is involved in JSRs, uh, participates in any JSRs? Yeah, I know he is. Uh, anybody else? No? Who's, who's tried? Okay, fine. So basically, I mean, it, it, it's a tedious process. You sign an agreement with the JCP, and then you, you know, once that gets approved and the JCP is happy with you, they then send an email to the spec lead of the particular JSR you're interested in, and the spec lead will then send an email to all the other expert group members, and then they vote on whether they let you in or not, and then they let you into this little private club where you get to, you know, this private mailing list and see what's going on and stuff like that, right? So that's not what I'm doing with 347. I mean, that part still exists to be compliant with the JCP, but all our communication is an open source. Uh, all, all, all our um, the implementations, the, the RI, the TCK, all of that's open source. All the communications are um, in the open. It's in a Google group, so anyone has access to it. Anyone can participate. Anyone can um, view these discussions. Anyone can join in. And I want this to be a community thing. I want people to participate. You don't have to be a data grid vendor or someone building a data grid to participate. Anyone is using something like this. I mean, I want to hear how, you know, what's important to people. I want to, I want to see how people use this stuff. That's right. so, so please do participate. I have some links at the end where, um, where I can point you guys to, to signing up to this list. Sorry? I'm sorry? Well, I mean, I, I, I can't comment about um, how, how JSRs in, are going to be run in future, but this is how I'm running this JSR. Um, I'd like to see more like this. Most of the JSRs run by Red Hat or, or with, with a Red Hat spec lead tend to be run in this manner. So, yeah. Any other big vendors? Yes, there are some. I'll talk about that at the end. But um, let's, I mean, I'm running short of time, so let's just dive into what's actually in the JSR for now. Yeah. Okay, so what have we got in there? The first thing, transactions no longer optional. If you actually want to be able to use the data grid as a, as a persistent data store, as a durable data store, not just a temporary cache, well, transactions can't be optional anymore. As you were saying, you know, correctness is important, and that has any, any implementation will have to support uh, transactions, will have to support JTA transactions. Now, it does not mean that every data grid instance needs to use it. You can configure, you can disable it if you, if you don't want it. But it, the implementation should support it, should be able to support it, right? All implementations will be distributed. Now, in JSR 107, again, it was optional that caches are distributed or not, or clustered or not, that, that was not mandated as a part of the spec. 
Um, here, by very nature of the fact that we are talking about data grids, they are distributed, right? And the part of the spec is we are defining a couple of terms, um, including fully replicated and partially replicated modes, synchronous and asynchronous transports, things like that. So if you were to configure, I don't know, ven vendor A's product as asynchronous, you know that vendor B's product configured in an asynchronous mode will give you the same quality of service, the same, the same expectation as to what's going to happen. Right? So that's important that you have, because um, right now a lot of the existing data grids, the terminology is very different, they're incongruent, um, learning curves are steep, things like that. The asynchronous API, and I said this was very useful for, um, I mean, since you are running in a cluster, you know that, that things are distributed and the network is the most expensive thing. Um, this is basically um, just essentially very, very similar to the JSR 107 primary API. You do gets, you do puts, you do removes, but these are asynchronous variants of those very same operations where instead of blocking on an operation, you get back a future and you can pull that future later. Now, this is very, very useful if you're doing a whole bunch of things in, in parallel. You can do a whole bunch of puts as a part of one transaction and you know that those puts are going to happen in parallel and you can pull the futures later as opposed to doing it in sequence. If you're using JSR 107, you do a put, it blocks, it goes across the network, it comes back. Then you do the second put, it blocks, it waits, it comes back, so on and so forth, and then you finish your transaction. Whereas here, you can do all of that in parallel in one go. So it's very, very useful for that. The grouping API, I mentioned this again to co-locate data to be able to tell the grid which keys should be stored together. And that's very, very important, again, to, to optimize for uh, network latency and overhead. Again, a lot of the existing vendors do support this. This is not new, this, none of this is new. It's just that there has not been a standard API for this. So this is what we're proposing, a standard way to do this. Um, that there are gonna be two different ways to group, to group uh, your entries. One is that group annotation. So let's assume that that is a typical key that I would use in, in my application, right? And usually, or most implementations would end up using the hash code of that key to determine where in the cluster that entry would be stored, right, by default. Now, if you were to annotate another method within that, uh, within that type as um, at group, instead of using the hash code, we'd, we'd actually call get group and use the result of that to determine where it's stored. Now, the effect you have there is that you can actually control which elements are stored together. Now, in this case, my type here is a stock symbol. I know that I can create a whole bunch of these types and store them in the grid. As long as they um, are all in the same exchange, they're gonna be stored in the same server. And that's really useful if I'm running transactions across um, anything in the same exchange, right? So, yeah. The other way to do that is to use a grouping, um, is, is to implement a grouper interface. Now, you can't always annotate a method in a class if you don't have access to that class, you don't have the source code to that class, it's a JDK class, things like that. You, you can't always do that, right? Now, this example over here assumes that the key in your, in your data grid is a string, right? So you can't go and annotate a method in a string. Um, so instead, I can provide an implementation of a grouper and register that with the data grid, and this will be used to determine where these particular keys are stored instead of the hash code of the string. Right? Now, the, the two methods over there, um, which I'm overriding, or which I'm implementing from, from the interface, the, 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 little, the, the method down there, the get key type, it just kind of um, declares what sort of types this, this group is going to handle. The other method over there, compute group, um, as you can see over here, is a very simple implementation. It just basically stores all keys starting with the same letter on the same server, right? Uh, I use your imagination, you can do a lot of complex things in there to, to determine where things are stored. The next thing I want to talk about is distributed code execution. Now this, again, to, to optimize for networks and things like that, you don't want to always pull data back. You want to be able to run code where data is. Um, this allows you to do that. A distributed callable will basically extend uh, the JDK's callable interface, and it'll provide a few extra methods around that, but it essentially will be a callable that you pass into the grid and it will run. On, um, on, on the grid. It can, either, it can either run everywhere in the grid or you can say run on specific keys so that we can locate where those keys are and run it in those nodes or you could even provide specific addresses and say run on these specific nodes. Right. I'll talk about MapReduce next. And we actually do support MapReduce as well but that's built on top of this framework. So on top of this API. Yeah. 
Yes. Are you referring to the asynchronous API I talked about earlier? Okay, there's a callable. Actually, mm -hmm. this is asynchronous, right? You know, if there's a merging the distributed environment. Yes. So we, we, we under the one transaction won't do all this. Mm -hmm. You know, every node. So still, the JTA has to bring. Yeah, but you can do you can you can do all the various constituent parts of that transaction in parallel, instead of waiting for each piece to finish. So this is a very, very simple example of using that distributed code API. Um, over here, I've got something called a cluster-wide count. Right? Um, now, a lot of this is actually using InfiniSpan. So InfiniSpan does have a size method on it, but the size method on the cache is not global. It's a local size. It only tells you what's, um, how big each particular node is, or how, much, how many entries are stored in any particular node. Now, let's assume you want to actually, uh, you, you want to know how much data is stored across the entire grid. You've got a thousand servers. Um, each one's got an InfiniSpan instance. You want to be able to count, um, calculate the size of the entire grid. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, over here, I'm, I'm creating an instance of a distributed callable. And what I'm going to do in the call method over there, I'm just returning cache.size. Very simple, right? So this is going to run on every node in the grid. And... On, over here, this is where I actually create an instance of new cluster-wide count. Um, I create a new default executor service, and I submit that executor service to the entire grid. I'm using the method of all submit everywhere, so it's going to go everywhere. I'm not saying on specific nodes or specific keys or anything like that. I want this to execute globally, and it's going to run everywhere. I get back a whole list of features, and each, um, um, each, each result over there is the size of each specific node. And I can now add that all up, and I've got the total. Again, it's a trivial example, but people have done very complex things with this. Um, use your imagination, basically. Um, you're talking about REST, you, uh, REST as an API? I'll talk about that at the end. That's not a part of the spec. That's not a part of the standard. Okay. I mean, InfiniSpan does support REST, but it's not part of JSR 347. Okay. The JSR is independent of Yes, it's, it's, 347 is independent. No, Yes, it's a 107 cache. It builds on top of JSR 107. Okay. So, yeah. so the data gate is like, uh, it's not just cache, but, but the actual underlying thing is cache. Yes. Okay. Yes. It starts at 107 and builds on top of that. So, so what, what makes it like not cache? Like I said, the fact that we mandate transactions, we mandate uh, distribution, and things like that, you now have the ability to build durable, more persistent systems. And when you do that, you then need to have more tools around it, like asynchronous APIs, grouping, collocation APIs, querying APIs, things like that. So, yeah. There's an SPI for that. That's all a part of 107. 107's SPIs. I'm sorry? I, I couldn't get that. Here's a class. Um, they are a part of the JSR in that they are participating in it. I'm not sure yet as to what they will implement, whether they really will implement it, but yeah. So let me skip ahead because I'm running out of time. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on MapReduce now, but I, I'm guessing people understand the paradigm around MapReduce. But basically that's going to be built on top of the, the callable, um, the distributed callable that we saw. I've got a couple of examples here, but I don't really have time to go into them in detail. But we're defining the mapper interfaces, the reducer interfaces. Um, and this is an example of how we used it to do a word count demo. Um, if you want to have a look at this demo, download InfiniSpan's distribution. Um, this demo is actually a part of the distribution, so you can actually have a look at it and see how it works. Now, before I finish up, um, I want to say, I keep mentioning InfiniSpan here, in that a lot of the... Um, examples I've used are from InfiniSpan. So this may not be the way the JSR finally shapes out to be, as I said. But conceptually, this is all going to be there. Conceptually, um, a MapReduce API is going to be there, a distributed callable API is going to be there, an asynchronous API is going to be there, etc., etc. I was going to talk about eventually consist eventual consistency and an eventually consistent API, but I suspect that's going to spark another hour-long discussion. So let's do that outside, perhaps over lunch. All right? So to sum things up, well, I was going to talk a little bit about InfiniSpan, but people seem to know enough about it. Essentially, it is a data grid. It is an open source data grid. Over and above JSR 107 and JSR 347, we also support, since you mentioned REST-based access, we also support REST-based 
transactions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a couple of other client server protocols for, for remote caches and things like that. We also support non-JVM access via these remote protocols, including um, the memcached protocol and things like that. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about it. Like I said, that's not really the focus of this talk. But there are links at the end to two InfiniSpan's downloadables to the distribution where you have all these examples where you can try out if you are interested. All right. So to kind of sum things up, we talked really about 107 and 347, two uh, JSRs related to distributed caching, to, to local caching, distributed caching, and distributed data grids. And I very briefly mentioned InfiniSpan. Um, I suppose you saw more of it in the examples in JSR 347. Now, like I said, I do want 347 to be run in the open, so um, there are some of the links that you'd be interested in. Um, the Google group over there for JSR 347, that's where discussions take place and things like that. Um, the, the data grid group over there on GitHub, that's where RIs, examples, um, TCKs, etc., are going to live. Again, if you're interested, go and watch that space. Uh, the first two links over there are the same for JSR 107. And the last link down there is for InfiniSpan. Now, this is a shameless plug for my upcoming book on InfiniSpan, if anyone's interested. You can actually pre-order it at URL if, you're, if, if anyone is interested. So with that, I know there's been lots of questions kind of as you're going along, so I'm guessing there won't be too many left. But if there are any questions, there, now's the time. When you say managing the memory, are you referring to eviction algorithms? Are you referring to eviction algorithms? Yeah. Yeah. That's implementation specific. That'll be a vendor specific thing. Yeah.